Today's episode of Lone Star Lawyers on the Varsity Podcast Network is brought to you by Varsity Search. Varsity Search builds great teams by connecting lawyers in Texas with career opportunities at small and boutique law firms. So if you're thinking of making a move or your law firm is looking to hire, please go to varsitysearch.com and book a time to visit right into my calendar. Varsity Search, building great teams. Hey everyone, Daniel Hare back with you on Lone Star Lawyers. I hope you and your family are both healthy and safe. Before we get started, I want to let you know about a few of the positions that we are currently searching for in Dallas. Still looking for some construction litigators, also just general business and commercial litigators, as well as a real estate securities lawyer. In Houston, looking for an estate planning attorney. In Austin, a family law attorney and an estate planning attorney. And then in San Antonio, an insurance coverage attorney. That and several others. Uh, so if those are something you might have interested in or one of those, uh, let me know, or if someone, you know, might be a good fit, please let me know Daniel of com, or you can find me on LinkedIn, check me out there. Uh, uh, and, uh, would love to visit with you and share with you about some of those opportunities. All right. Today we are in Dallas where our guest is Andy Jones. Andy is a plaintiff's personal injury trial lawyer with Sawicki law firm, where he proudly represents individuals and families who have been seriously harmed by the negligent and wrongful actions of others. Andy was recently given an AV preeminent rating by Martindale Hubble. He's on the board of directors of both the Dallas Association of Young Lawyers and the Texas Young Lawyers Association. He also serves on the court rules committee for the state bar of Texas. So he's a very, very busy guy. Glad to have him for a few minutes here on the show. With that, let's hop into our conversation with Andy Jones on today's Monday Mentors episode of Lone Star Lawyers. Andy Jones joins us right now. Andy, thanks so much for taking the time to be with us. No problem, Daniel. I'm looking forward to talking to you. Well, uh, I am as well and appreciate you taking the time. I know you're very busy between your law practice and all the other organizations you're a part of and ways that you are involved in the legal community in Dallas and around the state. And so I imagine that you've got your hands full. So I appreciate you taking some time to, to spend with us. Um, first off, uh, why don't you share a little bit about your uh, firm and your practice with us? So I am a plaintiff's personal injury lawyer, and I'm a trial lawyer at Sawicki Law. Um, we are a firm located in Dallas, but we go all over. I've been everywhere from uh, Lubbock to Tyler, from uh, San Marcos to uh, well north of Denton. So um, we do it all. We do wrongful death, catastrophic injury, and medical malpractice. There are fewer and fewer who do that these days. And yeah. um, I'm lucky enough to have been one of eight rising stars in the medical malpractice field. So um, I really enjoy it. And you know, I really like doing the work we do for the people we do it for. Fantastic. Well, and it's funny, offline, we were talking about uh, the conversation with uh, I'd had with Morgan McFeeters a few weeks ago. And like with her, and now with you, uh, within a period of hours before hopping on, I see you've got a new award to add on to your, uh, to your mantle there in a preeminent rating by A.V. Hubble. So tell, tell us about that. That's awesome. Congratulations. Well, thank you very much. Um, you know, I was, uh, you know, I was, just, uh, you know, Martindale calls and they say, hey, you know, um, you, you meet our standards. We'd like to get you reviewed. And so I was honored to have um, a number of lawyers that would, you know, spoke up on me beha- on my behalf. And um, I was really kind of flattered by a lot of the stuff they said on on the reviews. Um, and it really gave me an insight as to how other people see me and uh, the good I'm putting out in the world. So um, I'm really honored to be rated AV preeminent. Um, you know, it's it's uh, it's an honor and I really appreciate it. That's really, really great. Uh, not surprised, uh, but, uh, but happy for you and proud of you. Um, so, uh, I want to ask you a little bit about, uh, COVID here in a minute and just kind of what's been going on with that in your world. But before I do that, um, just in general, you mentioned kind of, uh, in talking about your practice areas, uh, medical malpractice, not that many folks doing that anymore for a lot of reasons. Um, but, uh, what, what has been, uh, kind of more of the, been more of the more recent developments within the plaintiff's personal injury practice, malpractice, uh, medical malpractice. Um, what are some of the things that are on the, uh, top of the list at CLEs and that kind of thing these days? 
Well, of course, overall in the personal injury landscape, it's the North Cyprus issue. The issue about what kind of discovery that a defense, the defense attorney can get into, not only what your bills were, but what the facility charges other insurances and people and things like that. Okay. Running off that Haygood versus Day Escobedo case from 2011, the, the paid versus incurred issues get really hot. Um, but also, um, you know, the brand new changes in the rules of civil procedure, that's a big deal because it, it, it federalizes the rules, in my opinion, and, and a couple of big things impact um, the intersection of medical malpractice and personal injury is that you have these initial disclosures now out front that are required, including disclosing information or economic calculations of your damages. Well, does that mean my pain, suffering, and mental anguish for which only a jury can put a price on? Um, additionally, experts have now changed about what you can disclose and what you don't have to disclose, draft reports, certain communications with experts. That changes, especially in the medical malpractice context, what I can do with an expert and what I'm expecting the other side to do with theirs. And then, of course, the expedited action rule has changed. That expedited action is now being all the way up to $250,000. I know a lot of doctors out there that are insured only for 200 or 250. Mm -hmm. So there's this tension between civil practice and remedies code says you're not supposed to state a specific amount, but the rules of procedure, but the rules of procedure say you have to state a specific a category of an amount in order to get discovery. Right. And then all that goes back to expedited actions. And you're a better lawyer than I, if you can uh, do an expedited action on a medical malpractice case. <laughs> <laughs> but that rule used to have an exclusion for med mal and land title and stuff where experts were guaranteed to be a part of it. And it's not necessarily the amount of controversy, but the complexity of the subject matter. And so that those are some really, really cutting edge new issues going on in our world. Yeah. Well, uh, for everyone listening, if you uh, didn't know what you were getting into coming in, I think you've maybe found a, a, a person to invite to your next CLE um, and speak <laughs> or... Uh, to uh, refer your clients to that come to you for these issues that you don't do um, and and, uh, and need someone to send them to for, for PI type work. So I think we've already established that from a minute eight here uh, on the recording. Um, You're very so kind, awesome. Danny. You're very kind. <laughs> uh, well, and I, I did want to also touch on um, uh, COVID, as I mentioned, and and uh, in, in really two respects. One, um, and, and we're recording this March 17th, um, for context and people listening much later, hopefully we're on the other side of this sooner than later with, with where vaccines are and everything else. But, uh, it just in recent weeks or months, what has sort of been the, the nature of the way that you're conducting, uh, the practice right now? Um, and has it changed much from six months ago or nine months ago? Um, and then also just, uh, are there, um, COVID related issues that clients have been coming to you with or, or anything like that, that you've seen, or that maybe you expect to see in the coming months and years? Well, as the elder millennial in our office, I have spent more time on the phone with clients being tech support, how to use a camera, how to use Zoom. <laughs> right. uh, it, it is before every depot, before every client meeting, before every mediation, I call them, and instead of getting into the subject matter, the first 15 minutes are, this is how you use the webcam. There you go. This is what you should be and where you should be doing it at. Um, but really, as far as the transition into the pandemic, um, my firm really was very agile in adapting to it. We got a Zoom subscription. Our court reporting service walked us through how to do depots. Um, uh, my boss, um, he's, uh, he's definitely not a millennial, um, but he jumped on and he took to it too. And so we were doing, I think I did, I did a hearing the week after the pandemic started and sent us all home. I did depots three weeks after that. Um, I really have been in, really embracing the practice. I've done experts. I've done fact witnesses. I've done summary judgments. I've done mediations. Um, so I think that this is a powerful tool. My biggest concern going forward is that um, we need to figure out what the beautiful hybrid looks like when we have in person back again. Yeah. Because yeah. it doesn't make sense for me to, you know, the, the week before the pandemic started, I flew to San Antonio for a scheduling conference hearing. <laughs> I flew to San Antonio for a scheduling conference hearing. <laughs> I then maybe, you know, three or four weeks later went on zoom to New Mexico to have a scheduling conference hearing. And that was a better use of my client's time and resources. Yes. Yes. So absolutely. Those are the issues that I think that we're going to have to figure out in the hybrid. 
Right. Yeah. And, and as we've, I think, talked here uh, in, in several different occasions, it seems like going forward, most everyone seems on board with there's going to be uh, a level of whether it's Zoom or, you know, web based hearings, uh, particularly for non controversial uh, type things. Uh, and on the depot side, similarly, maybe just sort of, you know, not the most important witnesses, but just getting the the record, that kind of stuff, just where it's not as necessary to, to be there in the room with them. Um, and it'll be interesting to see how that all uh, plays out. And, and obviously, the judges will dictate some of it in the way that they handle their courtrooms. And some are, I think, for the most part, have been really good about it uh, overall. Oh, yeah. Um, and, and, and maybe a few others, not as much. But I think in general, it's been good. And so uh, I'm, I'm interested and, and uh, optimistic about what we're going to see from that going forward. Well, and I agree with you. I think that judges really like being able to dispose of five motion to compel hearings before 9 a.m. by setting them up on teleconference or on Zoom. Yeah. Um, my concern is that I really am not in favor of any kind of virtual trial, even the voir dire aspect, right. in large part because I've, I, I've been in there. I've been in that room. I've been in when it happens. And th- justice is a thing that we do together in a place that we go to do it. That's why courtrooms look so imposing and there's an air of um, a level of almost sacredness around that space. Yeah. Because when you're asking 12 people to put someone in a cage, as Professor Sarah would say, or hmm. to take away their children or to whack somebody with a lot of money, um, that's not something you can do from the elliptical at your house. You remember that that California jury where the guy was on an elliptical for part of it and another lady went to take a phone call? <laughs> right. You, the, 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 the sacredness and the importance, the gravity of what you're doing, I really think is only something that you can achieve in person with the jurors in the box and the counsel at the rail. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and just, uh, as, as you're talking, it's making me, and I'm going to date myself here, but it's going to make me, it makes me think about, um, in the original Superman movies, um, in the late seventies and eighties, when, uh, Superman's father on Krypton's getting put on trial and the three kind of judges are just there in like some like hologrammed image on the screen. This council has no hesitation in proclaiming you all guilty. 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 And then they <laughs> vanish. You know, <laughs> it's like, is this how we're doing it now? Um, I guess that's how they do it on Krypton. Um, but uh, yeah, you, we probably don't want to go there necessarily. But uh, to the extent we can get some efficiencies and save some money for clients and time for lawyers and all that uh, in ways yeah. that don't hurt justice, obviously, I think we'll find ways hopefully to do that. Um, well, that's cool. So, um, one other thing I wanted to ask you about your particular firm and practice, uh, because I do think that, um, as I counseled law students for years, and then even now talking to more uh, experienced and lateral type lawyers, um, you know, uh, for, uh, getting into plaintiff's work and personal injury and that type of thing, uh, I think it's a little more challenging, um, than in other areas. I mean, you know, there's just the way that the, that practice is, has evolved over time, the way it's done in, in more of kind of small firm and even solo shops, they're just as compared to the defense side, um, you know, there's just not as many, uh, mid-size or large firms and things where there's just a lot of turnover and opportunities for young new lawyers to come through and get that experience. And and I'm wondering, as you uh, came out of law school and then as you've continued to to grow in your practice, you know, have you seen it that way? And how did you go about getting um, into it? And, and what would your advice be uh, to people, you know, that are looking to transition into more of a plaintiff's practice? Well, I think it starts with understanding the the landscape of plaintiff's practice, that a a plaintiff's personal injury lawyer, the famous adage is that they eat what they kill. You know, I earn the income that I obtain. If I get the case, I work it, I make the money off of it. And that is the structure, I think, in the post-tort reform world here in Texas, where it is harder to achieve a result, and therefore you want to keep more of what you get when you achieve that result. And there, yes, there are competitive advantages when you have a firm and economies of scale and things like that, but the economic incentive for a plaintiff's lawyer doesn't necessarily mean the, doesn't lead to the 10, 15, 20 lawyer firms yeah. like there might have been in the past or are on the defense side. Right. Um, I also kind of use the, the Star Wars analogy that there are a lot of 
Obi-Wans and Princess Leia's out there that are looking for a Luke Skywalker or a Rey to take over where they're leaving off. And I think that's the new development here in plainness practice um, is that there are a lot of solo or small firm lawyers that are, their kids are going to college. They're getting a little older. They don't want to go to a motion to compel hearing anymore. So they're looking <laughs> yeah. for someone to train and hand off the, and hand off the work too. Yeah. And, but the, problem with that is that you've got to network like crazy in order to find that opportunity and attach because in large part, it's based on personality. Yeah. Um, I knew that my, uh, I knew my boss and I clicked, um, I was maybe working there about six months and, um, we were talking about how I was going to go to a depot where we were, you know, we were the intervener. So we were kind of on, you know, good with the plaintiff and also good with the defendants or whatever. And he's like, he said, you know, Andy, we're in the neutral zone on this. I said, oh, don't make the Romulans mad. Got it. He's like, yes, don't make the Romulans mad. Right. I was like, okay. And I've worked there eight years now. So yeah. um, it, a lot of it's personality, a lot of it's networking. It's a recognition of, of the economic realities behind it. Um, also, it's very personal, it's definitely very personal. So you have to have the, the stomach and the emotional strength to do it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's right. I mean, and, and I think that goes to, and we have some of those same, that last part of it, I, I'm glad you mentioned, because we, we have some of those conversations around whether it be issues of criminal defense and family law and where it really is kind of the, you know, the livelihood uh, uh, or the pain or the damage or, you know, whatever of the individual person in their family, um, which is, you know, it, not that a, a company or in a business situation, you can't have that or, you know, but, but it's, it's just, it's, it's different when it's the individual person. Um, oh, yeah. I mean, it's just different. And so I think that's right. Like there, so there's a definite emotional, um, even like counsel that counselor, uh, <laughs> title really comes into play, right. In, in your area, probably more so than, um, in, in well, maybe business. Yeah. Well, if I can just jump in there is that I had, uh, that was that idea that we represented people that were, we found them where they were when they were hurting or when they were in trouble, um, really came home to me when I was, um, very early on in my career, I had the opportunity to inspect a helicopter crash wreckage and in the wreckage, I found my client's shoes. Hmm. He was burnt to death, but I found his shoes and that was it's like seeing those baby shoes when at yeah. the bottom of the Titanic wreck, yeah. you know, that's who we're here for. We are the yeah. shoes. Yeah. And so that can get very personal when you're staring down a motion for summary judgment thinking, well, if I lose this, the family that those shoes, that person used to belong to are going to lose everything. Yeah. And it's just, it's just an incredible pressure sometimes that you do have to distance from yourself from, but in order to do this right, you also have to embrace Yeah, because you have to go in there. You have to go to the rail and you got to speak for those shoes, speak for the person sitting next to you who's had the injury happen. Right. Um, you know, I've had the privilege to get to inspect some hospitals that we've, uh, we've sued in the past and to go into the space where the mom sat and cried, where the husband was, was on the phone telling the family members where these things happen to get to be in those same spaces there's a level, there's a gravity to it that you've got to be able to handle and bear. Yeah. How do you, uh, cause what, something that you made me think of there is, um, how you, uh, embrace that emotional element to the client and to the case, um, in an, in a way that's at an appropriate amount as, and I'm thinking that you kind of mentioned it where you have to separate some of that, um, cause I imagine that, you know, like any of us, we're human. And if we make decisions based on our emotions uh, all the time, like that can lead us into some troubling areas and make me make some bad yeah. decisions too. Like, so, um, how have you figured out how to kind of walk that line or, or how do you kind of check yourself or, or make sure, okay, I'm kind of, I've got a, enough of the emotion here and beyond it, I'd probably be in trouble or I might kind of be clouding my judgment as a lawyer and how to like, uh, you know, uh, effectively advocate for my client. Sure. And I think it begins by not personalizing it to yourself. Okay. You can't, you can't say, 
or at least the whole time. It, it, there are certain times you need to channel this energy in order to get the right argument or to make the right appeal, but you can't picture your wife in the hospital bed bleeding to death. Okay. If you picture your wife or your mother, you, you can't cross that line. Yeah. Because okay. then that just gets too deep. Right. Um, you also you really shouldn't engage in, um, you know, well, oh, I was I drove down that road the same day. I could have been in that. You know, you, yeah. You can't, you can't personalize it to you, right? But you do have to use your life experience. Um, I, I I I met a I met a woman who who was dying, and I got to talk to her and, and interview her and and. Um, I, I, you know, I watched her husband care for her and I immediately picked up the phone afterwards and I called my wife and I said, I want to be like them. Hmm. You know, you've got to take the good out of that situation where you got to, you got to look into your own life and say, I can make my life better. I can be a better husband and father knowing what these people are going through yeah. and trying to, trying to channel it from a positive direction yeah. rather than say, oh my gosh, this could happen to me. This is the lesson I should take away from this on how to make my life warmer and richer and more positive. Yeah. Um, it doesn't change at nine o'clock at night when you're sitting there writing the motion for summary judgment and you're thinking about yeah. well, what happened to him. Sure. Uh, yeah. Well, response to summary judgment. We plaintiffs never file summary <laughs> well, judgment. I was going to say no. That's, yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. The response. Well, and, and, and I don't. The response. I don't mean to put too fine a point on it, but the the other part about it is is that you do also have to have have to have a professional distance from what you're doing yeah. because the clients also come to you for objectivity mm -hmm. because it, it, if it's the client, they want to, you know, get their posse and, and, you know, go knock on the door and, and beat up the, beat up the doctor who messed them up. Um, they do come to you for objectivity and approaching it from a clinical aspect of this is the box I can play in. I often tell my clients that this is the extent of the law. Mm -hmm. If you want something more than this, I can't give it to you. Right. And so then maybe we're both thinking about, no, it's, yeah, you wanted to punch that guy, but we're not going to punch that guy. You know, we're going to go get his insurance policy and call it a day. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah. that's, that's the way to create that clinical distance. What's the uh, best piece of advice you can remember receiving in your first couple of years of practice as you were getting started that uh, you still think about or still use or still part of you? So um, I keep a list of lessons I learn every year. So I'd, I'd be happy to, if anybody wants to hear them, you know, email me and I'll give them to you. Um, but one of the first lessons I learned was that you sh there's no problem that you can't fix by talking about it. Hmm. You've got to reach out. You've got to talk. You've got to come with a solution, especially if you're the one who caused the problem. <laughs> right. Um, but there's no problem you can't fix by talking through it. It may be that you, you lose and this is bad. But we're all working through it. We're all working it together. Most of the time, it's fixed. Um, the other, the other one that I think is really important is that um, you uh, you can't borrow trouble, you know, because you, you can't think about how bad things could get or how big, bad things could be or catastrophize or think through that. You've got to deal with where you are and what you're doing and and you know, like they say in racing, focus on the road, not the wall. Don't think about hitting the wall focus on driving down the road. And so it's those two kind of things where reach out, communicate, and then focus on what you need to do without catastrophizing. Those I think are really key. Yeah, no, I think that's good. And I appreciate you offering to, to share, uh, those lessons. And so we'll put, uh, that, I, I got one more, but you may have to edit. Okay, it out. let's do it. We'll, we'll make that judgment call later. <laughs> so I'll tell you both. Versions. Okay. Um, the, the other piece of advice that I got very early on in my career, which was very helpful, which was don't be an Hey, I, I think, I think the piece of advice, it, it's, that's a good the one piece of advice I got. Yeah. Yeah. yeah um, so I'll say it again for the, for the edited version, but, um, the, the best piece of advice, uh, not best piece of advice. One of the pieces of advice I got early on that has been very helpful, which is don't be a jerk. Just don't be a jerk. It's, uh, sometimes, uh, the most simple type of things like that, that we still need to say and think about over and over because honestly, when I'm talking to candidates about where they want to go in terms of their next law firm or whatever, um, you know, almost exclusively the number one thing is I don't want to go someplace where 
you know, people are jerks. Um, and so like, right. and so now I'm kind of speaking more to the more senior lawyers who are in the place of hiring. If you want to build a good team of the best people, um, don't be a jerk. <laughs> and uh, that's important. Um, but I think it goes up and down the line and it's, uh, you know, but we, there is a tendency to, um, for that not to just be the way that everything is done and within the legal profession. And unfortunately, so we have to keep saying it. Well, and I think that it's a rec- this, that, rule is a recognition of someone's basic humanity yeah. that yeah. you have to remember that we're people throughout all of this. And I think if you want to create a corporate culture or a hiring culture or a firm culture, you've got to recognize people's basic humanities. And I think that that means everything from you got to know that your associate should has to leave by five because, yeah, they may want to take a walk around the block, eat dinner with their spouse before they bill another three hours for you. Right. Um, you know, they, they are going to want to take, I'm an overly involved millennial father. I am going to want to take a couple of weeks off when my son or my daughter is born. <laughs> Did it both times. My kid has no idea, but you know what, who remembers my wife? Yeah. That we're that much closer. Our relationship is that much better. So she can put up with the fact that I'm in my sister's garage talking to you like this. You know? <laughs> <Right. laughs> it's a great looking garage. It looks better than my office. So uh, you're in great hey, shape. Thank you. <laughs> um, so you know, you spent, and as we kind of talked about earlier in the environment you did, uh, in a small plaintiff's firm, um, came up as an associate there. Um, and I wonder, um, now that you've kind of, uh, can look back on that time and, um, as you maybe see, have seen some of your other colleagues and classmates, um, that have been in practice now for several years. Um, what do you think are one or two, um, key components to an associate having success in their law firm and really standing out and making an impact? So I think um, the number one thing is, is that uh, never say no. It's the first rule of improv. Never say yeah. no. Yes. And right. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. And now there are, there are limits and we're not going to go into that, but it's, yeah. you know, somebody says, Hey, I need this briefed or, Hey, have you ever seen this before? Or, or, you know, do you want to come do this? Yes. Yes, I do. Um, you want to go to that hearing. You want to help out on that motion. Um, because that, you know, that breeds more work that breeds more success. And then you're going to see, I mean, you're going to do a heck of a lot if your attitude is yes. And, um, and I think that's, that is frankly the biggest thing because everything else goes down from there. You want to, you know, you want to come early, you want to stay late, you want to be helpful. You want to be, uh, especially in a plaintiff's firm, you also want to think towards the business side. So if there's an event to go to, or if there's a marketing opportunity, um, you can't just sit in your office and bill hours. We don't bill hours, but you can't just sit in your office and bill hours. You've got yes. And you got to get out there. You got to market, you got to hustle. And you got to do quality work, right. but it's more than just sitting at your desk, cranking out the motions. Yeah. And by the way, every civil defense lawyer that's listening to this, when you said we don't bill hours, just went <laughs> <laughs> jealous rage overcame them. <laughs> yeah. But you know what about my, uh, but they, uh, they never work pro bono, right? I work pro bono every time I lose. So that, every, <laughs> that's right. But you don't ever lose though. You're preeminent. You know what? I have been very blessed in that regard, but, uh, you know, so you, you do win some and lose some. So. Yeah, of course, of course, the nature, nature of things. Um, so, uh, I, I wanted to spend a little bit of time asking, I mentioned in uh, the, the very start here that you do spend in a lot of time, uh, with organizations, uh, Texas Young Lawyers, Dow Association of Young Lawyers, um, others as well. Um, why did you, uh, I mean, that's a decision. It's a conscious choice. You made that choice. Um, not everyone does. Um, why did you do that? Why, why did that, why was that an important thing for you to do? Um, as a, I mean, you've done it from day one, basically my recollection. So t- tell us about that a little bit. So, um, it's two themes. One is, um, I have always enjoyed being a part of things that are bigger than myself, which means clubs, groups, and organizations. So personally, I derive a lot of satisfaction of working with other people towards a common cause in a group setting, personal. Yeah. Professional, um, I actually almost didn't. I was going to stuff and I wasn't really getting, feeling like it, this was what I was looking for. And then I called Jim Wren and he explained to me how important these things were, especially in a plaintiff's practice, hmm. that um, your number one referral is another lawyer. Yeah. And so you've 
got to go, got to know other lawyers. You got to be involved with other lawyers. Um, and, uh, you know, when Jim Wren says something, you, you, you follow his advice and do it. Um, so I then dove in a little bit more into DAYL, Dallas Association of Young Lawyers, and picked something that I, I felt the personal, which was doing something in a group together towards a common cause, but also really went with my, with my practice area. I was, um, I got on the judicial internship committee. I got my job because I was a judicial intern. And here was the opportunity to go work with 40 judges <laughs> who I was in front of every day. And that's yeah. never a bad thing. Yeah. That's awesome. So I've kind of pursued the leadership track because more of the, I enjoy being in a group working towards a common cause. And I feel like that at each level I've had the opportunity to make a difference and where other people let me make that difference. I'm going to keep going until I, until they say, please, you're no longer the change we can tolerate. Stop. Uh, I imagine there are a number of people that are in the boat that you were in those first year or two of, of practice when you were kind of going to the events, but not really feeling it, not getting plugged in, not feeling like it was a, a comfortable place. Um, you know, what, what advice would you have for those folks who are kind of on the fence and, and or just, or may not even on the fence about whether to stay in or out, but just trying to figure out how can I, uh, you know, become more comfortable or get more involved or, or how can I feel like it's not just I'm one more thing on my schedule that I've got to go do out of burden or, you know, something like that. Sure. Sure. So the first thing is, is that unless you live on uh, in a very, very small County, there's always another group. Dallas, we have Dallas young lawyers, Dallas women lawyers, the DBA. We, I mean, we got it all. Yeah. So if you're not feeling a particular group after you've really made an effort, that's fine. There are, there's always another group to be a part of. Yep. Dial yourself into something you're interested in, in a place in a, with a group of people that you want to be a part, be a part of. Um, but as far as getting involved specifically, I think, I think that you need to, um, one of my things is I always bring a friend. If I go someplace I haven't gone before, you bring a friend. And then that way you have somebody to talk to. Um, but also you, you double your coverage there. Some, you know, I know somebody and we're all talking or they know somebody and we're all talking and you should just look at it as an opportunity to make another friend or meet another human being. Hmm. I think too many young lawyers go into these settings. Um, the worst is when they go in there and they think, this is how I'm going to get a job. I'm going to talk to somebody and they're going to offer me a job. And it never works that way. It's going to happen once. Um, <laughs> right. But really what it is, is you're making a friend, you're getting to know somebody, you're getting to know an organization. So then when the moment strikes, when the opportunity arises, you will know the people and you'll be able to be involved. You know, with the judicial internship thing, I was talking, I, I was talking to somebody and I mentioned I had been an intern and that person talked to somebody, talked to somebody and then, you know, I'm on the JI committee. Um, I, I think that also you should really, the other part about it is, is you should really consider why you're there. And if you're there for professional development and networking with other lawyers, that's one mindset. If you're there to get out of the office and, and just, you know, not be a lawyer for a little bit, that group is there too. Yeah. But you got to meet them. You got to get to know them and you got to, you know, give it some time. Sure. And if you brought a friend, you won't be bored and you'll have somebody to hang out with when, you know, yeah. if you can't find anybody to talk to. Oh, that's great. That's great. Good advice. I, I think it's great. And I think it's, uh, it's important for people that are really wanting to try to get connected and are just struggling, um, to have different tools to try to figure out how to, uh, how to better do that. So I appreciate that. Um, I'd also say you should have a, uh, um, you should also have a question that, you know, you want to ask everybody and that way you, you have an automatic icebreaker, wow. you know, um, after, after the initial pleasantries, you know, a lot of people ask, Hey, what are you working on? And if you're a first year associate, it's like, I'm working on researching a novel legal issue that no one really cares about. And you are not interested in, you know, um, you know, start, you know, pick an interest that's in, pick something that's interesting to you and ask about that. And if they say that they don't know or whatever, it's an opportunity for you to tell them. So have a, have at least one question or topic you want to talk about or ask about in any conversation. Yeah. That, and I think, uh, broadening that out some, I, I think the, the idea of instead of thinking of things to say, thinking of questions to ask it, is the right mindset to be in because you really do want to engage the other person and be interested in their story and what they're doing and, you know, their family and their life and all of that. Um, and I think sometimes, 
uh, in, in kind of that little, you know, the cliche cocktail party dynamic or whatever. Um, uh, uh, there's a lot of, uh, uh, how much can I tell about myself and my stories and stuff? And, and, and that can also be pressured and trying to think of what to say too. Like, so questions to me are so much simpler in a lot of ways. Um, they don't have to be long. They don't have to be super in depth, but they can just get that other person talking. And, and then that, exactly. it's, it's great. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, as we're, uh, man running through time here. So, uh, kind of turning the corner here. Uh, one quick question about, um, just career, uh, development, hiring, all that kind of stuff. If someone's coming into your firm to, uh, interview for what, I mean, it may be a clerkship, maybe it's an attorney position, whatever. What, what, what are some things that you've seen or what advice did you have about, um, how that person can, uh, do well in an interview setting for a position at a firm like yours? So I, I think it's confidence and competence, um, not necessarily from the, per, from the interviewee, but from, the, 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 the vibe you give off as the interviewee to the interviewer okay. in that uh, in, a, in a firm of our size, you're going to be doing the work and you're going to be doing it directly with us and you're going to be doing it directly for the client. There is no layer between you and the, the in-house counsel, then the CEO, and then finally to the, you know, the inner sanctum or whatever. Yeah. And so confidence, I should feel you are confident, not braggadocious, not egotistical, but as a person, I should think, you know, okay, this is a person I can trust to talk to the client, go to this place, have access to medical records, ha- have the, the the secrets, have the password to Westlaw, yeah. you know? Um, and, and that, I think, is demonstrated by the personal vibe you get with somebody. It's through that basic level of humanity that don't make the Romulans mad, you know, yeah, right. thing. Um, but also competence. But competence is done by after the resume because – I'm going to see your resume. I got it from Daniel. Daniel says you're great. You went to Baylor Law School. So, of course, I'm going to hire you on competence wise. <laughs> right. Of course. So now it goes to confidence. Do I have confidence in you to do the things we're here to do? Yeah. And that is only, and my boss, my boss asked me if I could type because he's from the age when you dictated. <laughs> yeah. And so I said, yes, I can type. You know, okay, well, that, okay, now we're talking. And he used to write for the newspaper. And it's like, oh, well, you know, I still get the paper. Oh, you still get the paper. <laughs> and now we're talking, we're, we're talking as people, your experiences. It's so important to remember for young lawyers in the interview process and everywhere that you are a person, you are a whole person. And law firms are looking for a whole person, especially a firm of my size. Yeah. I'm I not looking say. for. Yeah. I'm, I'm not looking for a fungible billing unit. Right. I'm looking for a person. Yeah. So I want to know about who you are. Yeah. No, I don't want to know what's in your Netflix queue unless we're talking about that. But you know, if you have an experience that comes to bear on why you want to be a plaintiff's lawyer, if you've traveled extensively and you see the picture and you, and you see the pictures from my trip, I want to talk about that. You want to, we want to talk about what connects us right. and what makes me want to sit next to you on the car ride to East Texas in right in, at the council table at trial. Yeah. And if I don't, if I don't have confidence in you as you, who, who you are as a person, I, you're never going to cross that threshold. Really, really good stuff. Well, uh, rapid fire questions. Uh, here we go. Uh, one word, one phrase. Uh, we, we play loose with the facts there on that one, but uh, <laughs> whichever you prefer. Name one trait or characteristic that you most want to see in an associate. Loyalty. Loyalty. What habit has been key to your success? List making and calendar entries. There you go. Your favorite app or productivity tool. Oh, um, iCal is just calendar, man. You got to be able to calendar anywhere you go. Calendar Calendar entries, get stuff done. There you go. Uh, your favorite social distancing activity. I don't know how long we're going to leave this question in, but uh, it's been there since April. So last April, (laughs) (laughs) a FaceTime phone call with someone you have never seen in person before. Ah, awesome. Okay. That's cool. So have you, you've done that and that's been a thing. Yeah, I've had a couple of people, um, one, a couple of young lawyers asking for mentor advice. Yeah. And so as millennials, I'm like, hey, I'll just FaceTime you. Yeah. And so that's cool. I get to see you, your face, yeah. your you, everything about you and your emotions when we talk and stuff like that. And it's like I've left the house and met somebody. That's awesome. 
Awesome. All right. Last one. And uh, of course, the most important, your favorite legal movie. So uh, I watched this one when I was uh, working at the Baylor Law School Library. My favorite one is Breaker Morant. Breaker Morant. You're the second person to mention it. Who else? You're not, You're not the first. You're not the first. Did they work at the law library? That is hilarious. Kevin Cherry uh, is a Baylor lawyer. Uh, so he uh, mentioned it and was the first one. It's on my radar. It's on my list. I have not seen it yet. Um, and he calls me every now and then and says, have you seen Breaker Morant yet? And I haven't yet. So I have to always keep this. So I'm going to have to watch it so I can answer him yes, finally. Um, but uh, so for people that didn't listen to that episode, and since it's one that probably not as many people know, share real quick the the what that's about and why you like it. Breaker Morant is about the court-martial of uh, two British soldiers during the Boer War in South Africa. And um, there is a question as to whether or not they're killing of some Boer, of, of some Boers, they're called Boers, but they're people, but it's the, the Dutch word for farmer. Um, during, was it, was it justified? Was it not? Da, 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 da. And it goes through not only the court martial process, but also it's a, it is a reflection of how outside influences come to bear on a decision, both at the level where you're making it, where Breaker Moran is deciding whether or not to shoot versus what ultimately happens to him as a result of the process. And so, um, it was, it's just phenomenally acted. It's an interesting niche kind of, pl- uh, area of history you don't know much about. Um, and it really is a, a human tale about how, what happens to people when they get into difficult situations. Uh, yeah. It's definitely something you want to watch during the daytime because it is a little sad. <laughs> well, you know, uh, we've done, um, uh, on the li- like if you go to like imdb's list of top whatever legal movies breaker morant's going to be at the top of the list like uh, two three or four something like that so for these like yeah. classic old school um uh you know uh movies with some of these old timey movie stars um there are some good legal ones uh, uh and so um anyway well that's what i love about breaker morant too is that uh, you know breaker morant isn't entirely a, a procedural it's not you know yeah it doesn't all all take place in the courtroom so if you're not as initially turned on i mean i don't watch law and order i don't watch any legal tv right. anymore because of that's like bringing work home <laughs> yeah yeah right. you, you pick up breaker morant and it's not like that yeah yeah yeah, yeah. well and uh we had done a poll on linkedin the last week or week before for our next movie and actually to kill a mockingbird won that poll so speaking of the classics that will be the next one that we do i don't know where it'll fall in sequence to this episode airing here with you andy but um uh well, that will be the next one that we do so uh i love that you mentioned it thanks for for that it's it's uh, i'm i'm happy about that so that's great absolutely it was a great movie yeah well uh, and thank you again for taking the time to spend with us we appreciate it and wish you and your firm all the best. Thank you very much, Daniel. All the love to you and yours. All right. My thanks again to Andy Jones for joining us on the show today. If you enjoyed this episode, would you consider doing two things for me? Would you subscribe so you don't miss an episode? And then would you rate and review the podcast in Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen? And quick note on that, We've recently gotten up into that top two or three mark in iTunes for uh, some key searches like Texas Lawyer, Texas Lawyers, and some others. And that's directly attributable to you all going on and rating, reviewing, listening on Apple Podcasts. So thank you for doing that. And if you haven't yet had a chance to leave a rating or review, please do that. We'd love to sit in that top spot for those search terms and uh, allow for more people to be able to find us. So uh, thank you for all of that. Also, don't forget, If you are interested in any of the opportunities I mentioned earlier or just want to visit about what opportunities there might be out there for you, please get in touch with me. Daniel at varsitysearch.com would love to visit with you. All right, that's it for today's episode of Lone Star Lawyers. Thanks again so much to each of you for listening. I'm Daniel Hare with Varsity Search, and we'll talk with you next time. Mm -hmm.